we're going to talk about the seller that is sitting there and has sold his house to two different people at the same time. You want to avoid that, and we're going to talk about how that happens right here on News Talk 870. This is Lance Kenmore with the Kenmore team, and I'd like to welcome you to this week's edition of the Tri-Cities Real Estate Update. As always, you can contact me, Lance Kenmore, anytime direct on my cell phone at 727-8977, or visit us on the web at kenmoreteam.com. Once again, I always like to thank John for hosting and everybody here at the station for working to make this happen. Mr. John McKay, how you doing over there? It's been a busy week. It, it has been a busy, busy week, but really, at the end of the day, more of the same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Except uh, our daughter plays on a select softball team. Oh, which and... pre- provides its own set of challenges. Well, it's a pretty high-powered team. And what we're finding out is that um, a whole bunch of tournaments in Washington, the organizers are saying, well, we're moving to Idaho. And they're moving those to Idaho. Yes. Yep. Lewiston is. next weekend, a massive tournament that was in Longview. And a lot of a lot of folks, if they can, they're doing that. They're moving things to states that are open, and Idaho is wide open. So. And then I think, was it the fair canceled? This? Uh, Pendleton Roundup Pendleton canceled. Pendleton Roundup, okay. First time since World War II. Yeah, it is. That was um, a... It's quiet. It's quiet around here. But yeah. I will tell you... It's not quiet in the housing market. The housing market is... Which is good for you. It is showing a lot of resiliency through this time and even still being in phase one. uh, The housing market is acting like it's in phase four. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And so so it is um I mean it's it's busy. And so quick local update, we are still seeing and we're going to talk a little bit about that today when we get through some of our stats, but we're still seeing multiple offers on mm-hmm. the many of the properties especially below 300,000. So, I mean there is still I mean, there was a property this week that we were in, involved in with our buyers. 17 offers on that, wow. on that property. There was, a, there was another story from one of my buyer's agents of a line of four cars waiting in line in front of the house to, sh- to show the house. Ooh. So it's just, I mean, it's still, the weather outside is hot. The uh, housing market is matching that, and Mm -hmm. it is also very hot itself. So we're going to talk about dealing with multiple offers today. But before we get to that, we always like to look at our crazy national real estate story. Mm -hmm. And so this one, our celebrity real estate story from Variety.com. Um, Dean Koontz, the author, um, horror fantasy author, Mm -hmm. him and his wife sold their Newport Coast, um, California house, $50 million. Wow. What I thought was really interesting about this, about this property, um, in of itself is it was not um, offered on the open market. So this mm. is like what they would call in real estate a pocket listing. I see. So an, a- an agent um, knows the owner. The owner says, I'm willing to sell this. You can shop this to your network of friends. but Qualified buyers. I don't want showings. I don't want a lot of publicity about this. And so it was really odd because this is one of my only celebrity real estate stories that I don't get to oogle over the pictures of the inside of this house because there was no listing. There was no professional pictures on the oh. interior. But the stats that they were able to collect from the public data and drone, um, kind of analyzing drone f- um, photos, mm-hmm. is absolutely incredible. So it is a two and a half acre lot in the hills above Newport Beach, mm-hmm. um, which is a huge lot. They built this house in the early early 2000s and it has 30,000 square feet of living space. What? I mean it's just I can't I can't even imagine number 1 I don't want to clean that. I mean yeah. that's insane. Um and they also had a subterranean parking structure 
that they estimate could hold up to 12 different cars. Wow. So, 30,000, that's that's 20 times bigger than our house. <laughs> so apparently, um, apparently his novels have continued to be selling well. So, uh, you know, I look up and I say, why would someone like this be selling? Um, it was reported that they moved to and purchased a $10 million property. You know, a drop in the bucket. Oh, in, yeah. In, in comparison. And so making... Um, making the move so from from that um orange county property um they bought a 10 million and the buyer of the property is being reported i didn't recognize the name right off the bat but when i did a little research as glenn stearns from jackson hole wyoming hmm. so glenn stearns he had a lending company stearns lending that he had built up into a multi multi million dollar company and he is the guy on the discovery real estate series called undercover billionaire oh. where they like dropped him in a city and he had 90 days to make a million dollar business wow um, so when i pulled up the pictures i totally recognized him he had previously had been reported like two years ago leaving california for jackson um hole in wyoming but apparently he's wanting to work his way back there and he is being reported as the off-market buyer so hmm. knowing um knowing his track record he's been on a couple different reality tv shows and stuff I think that pictures of the property will soon begin to surface. <laughs> I, I I don't think a guy like him is going to keep the privacy that that Koontz had with that property. So I'm excited to take a look at that and and see what that see what that looks like. On to our local market. It's still a tale of lower inventory. And as I talked about in the intro, one of the things that lower inventory leads to higher is prices, higher prices and multiple offer mm -hmm. situations. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about, because and I mean, there was really I mean, property after property in the last week and a half that we kept seeing multiple offer situations getting into those. But the first half of the show, I want to talk about seller strategies in multiple in multiple offers hmm. and if you're in a price point especially if you're that 300,000 and below if you're if you're in a price point like that what does that look like and what does that mean for you to have a multiple offer strategy and one of the things real life that brought this up for us is we had a perfect example where a listener called in this week and man the listeners have just been hitting us with tons of referrals and sending over business so i can't thank you guys enough during this trying time to trust us to navigate that situation but a listener had reached out and said hey i found this property in Kenowa i want um and so we're like yeah great let's try to get an appointment um and we can go check it out we're going to be following guidelines you know it's it's always interesting when i'm talking to people and i said okay hey, i know you want to go check out this property i just want to warn you you know when we meet you there ahead of time one person at a time is going to be able to see the property etc cetera, etc cetera, like we've talked about for 12 weeks on the show mm -hmm. um so we get out there they like the property we end up getting them under contract on that on that property, but they have to sell their house. And so last year, um, same time, house on the market, not sold, no offers, et cetera. This year, looking at our pricing strategy, what the market was doing, multiple offers within two days of being on the market. So different story, but one of the things that we talk about is what's our strategy gonna be when we see the demand on a house? So the first strategy that we see a lot of, and our listeners might've ran into, is a waiting period with a highest and best. So is what they call it in the industry. So for instance, we might put a house on the market on Friday, mm -hmm. um, say monitor those showings and people will start showing it maybe Friday night, then they start showing it Saturday. And let's say we have five or six showings and we pre-tell people um, you are going to have until Monday night at 6 p.m. to bring us your highest and best offers. We're not going to review any offers until then. So that's one strategy using a predetermined waiting period. So what are the risks, though, with that strategy? Well, hmm. risk number one is are you priced aggressively enough 
to nothing's guaranteed in real estate, but are you priced aggressively enough to almost guarantee that you're going to get multiple offers? Because the risk with advertising that ahead of time is that you don't get any offers over the weekend and Monday night at six o'clock comes everybody else that saw the initial wave of advertising thought, well, there was going to be a waiting period. So that home's gone. If they didn't write an offer on it, then they're not looking at it mm -hmm. next week as, as the time progresses when it could yeah. still be available. So that's a risk to, to talk about in that situation. Um, and so you have to talk with your agent about, are we going to do a predetermined waiting period? The second option that we have that's kind of a hybrid of that is if it looks like, so let's wait till we get that first offer. And then if it looks like we're going to get two offers, then we can decide on the fly to institute a deadline. Mm -hmm. So the difference there being say, hey, we're not putting comments out there. We're not saying there's a guaranteed waiting period. But we're going to get that first offer. And when that first offer comes in, we're going to take a couple hours and evaluate how many other showings do we have coming up? What else do we have coming up? Do we think that we can get an offer in the next two to three hours? And then once we have two offers in hand, then we could institute a waiting period. We could then call back both parties and say, hey, there's a second offer that has come in. We're going to give each of you till tomorrow at noon to bring your highest and best. So that's a kind of a hybrid situation that we see happen a lot with that strategy. Second strategy that I wrote down that we see out there is that you, let's say you do get two offers. You are in that multiple offer situation and you do get two offers, is you can pick the stronger offer of the two to counter first and see and see what happens so you price the house at 250,000 you get one offer at 245 and you get one offer that was that was near full price but not quite at 248 well let's say for instance let's pick the 245 let's say that 245 was all cash with um, no financing contingency. So it's a little bit less than the 248. But generally, you like the terms of that 245 one. It's a little mm -hmm. bit stronger. And you say, hey, man, 90% of their terms are awesome. That's the stronger offer. If that was 250 on price, we would just take that. We wouldn't even give the other the other party an option. Mm -hmm. And so you can just counter what you feel is the strongest offer. So you could go ahead and say to back to the 245 and say, hey, we received your offer. Here's 250. Should you be willing to accept? Then we're going to go. Then we're going to go with with your offer and maybe never even get a counter offer to the 248, which initially looked like was the stronger offer on mm. price. So the what are the risks? So we're always looking risk reward, right? Well, the risk you're dealing with there is how bad do the does the 245 cash offer want the property? A lot of times all cash offers want a discount because they know that they're more attractive. Mm -hmm. So the risk is during the couple of hours that you're dealing with the 245 offer, the 248 offer goes away. So you you counter that offer at 250. You're waiting to hear from the cash buyer and the 248 offer. They're not very patient. They haven't heard by that evening when they thought you would be getting back to them and they withdraw their offer. And then potentially the cash offer says, no, nope, we're not taking 250. We're going to stick with our 245. And you're sitting there now with you went from two to zero offers. Yeah. And your negotiating power of going back to the cash offer and say, oh, just kidding, we'll mm -hmm. take your 245 is not a really strong place to negotiate from. Yeah. So that's You're the stuck. that's the risk side of that. And so this is a consultation with with your agent, and you're sitting down with your agent and saying, for our current environment, for the factors we're considering. And what's interesting, this can change hourly in this market. This is not a one size fits all. This is not like we're going to do this no matter what. And if you have that 
strategy of we're just going to do this one no matter what, I think you could really be missing the boat because this can change hourly. So you need mm -hmm. to be talking to your agent about what these options are, how we're going to handle that. Now we're coming up on our first break, but when we come back, I want to talk about the what I believe as one of the most dangerous strategies mm. in multiple offer position. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the seller that is sitting there and has sold his house to two different people at the same time. You want to avoid that, and we're going to talk about how that happens after the first break. Right here on News Talk 870. Welcome back to the Tri-Cities Real Estate Update. Today we've been talking about local real estate, what's going on. We've been mm -hmm. talking about the lower inventory. Um, still a, a great market out there. I mean... At times with the restrictions and stuff, it's you want to feel like you got one hand tied behind your back. But, you know, at this point, we've gotten used to it, how those showings go, what that looks like. And and the market is the market's busy. So we don't want to put the brakes on on that at all. We have been talking about the result of that being multiple offers. Before I get to that, I tend to get wrapped up in awesome content like this and run out of time. So before I get to that, because because inventory is so low, I do want to get out my pick three for the week. Mm -hmm. We have had some fantastic new inventory put on the market. Um, pick number one, 2697 Kyle Road. This is a four bedroom, three bath, um, plus a bonus room. And it's on a half an acre that backs right up to um, Little Badger out there. Ooh. Mature landscaping, fruit trees, garden space, um, 3,000 square feet, Ooh. vaulted entry, formal dining. You got oak hardwoods on the main level, large kitchen island, um, slider off the kitchen to a deck. And you, so you've got that half acre lot. You've got the little badger view, gorgeous, gorgeous setting out there on Kyle Road. Um, laundry room and full bath on the main level, and then Brazilian cherry floors on the stairs and the Ooh. second level. Gorgeous, gorgeous hardwoods. Um, extra bonus room on the second floor could be an office, could be a game room, fifth bedroom, or exercise room. And like I said, I mean, so many great features, the landscaping, the outdoor space. Right now, it's, here we are. I don't know about you, but I call them Tri-City Nights. Mm -hmm. Like they have just, we have had gorgeous evenings and that temperature, this has the living space to outdoor to take care of that. 2697 Kyle Road, and that's coming on the market at 439,900. So 3,000 square feet, killer location, great, great spot. Mature landscaping, which means Absolutely. it's not all going to die get on Get a yet. little bit of that shade and it's going to be, yeah it's, yeah, it's nice for sure. Pick number two, I'm going to take you over to Kennewick, and we do not get condos in this price range very often. 4214 West Klamath, unit B4. This is a three-bedroom, three-bath condo in West Kennewick Chateau 42. Mm. Nice complex, 1662 square feet. You've got a covered patio, vaulted ceilings, neutral paint colors. I've sold a number of condos in this complex over the year and Everybody seems super happy here. Stainless steel appliances, large living room, has a pellet stove. Upper Ooh. level master has its private bath, large vanity. Um, bonus area loft has a little library with built-in shelving, so great space. Um, and you've got monthly condo dues that cover most of the exterior building maintenance, grounds maintenance, irrigation, pool it's warm enough you want the pool now um clubhouse and workout rooms um and that is coming in at 205 wow so you're hard pressed to find something livable this nice in that two hundred and five thousand dollar price range um, that's it, a lot it, of square footage over in, 16 yeah 1662 in kennewick in this in a central location great great property 
That'll be gone. And then pick number three, <laughs> I'm going to take you out to 1210 Van Giesen in Richland. And this is a historic F house. So Ooh. the two story, the square, mm-hmm. square, square boxes, I call them, but with the great dormers. Um, love the F houses have been in a number of them over the years and i gotta tell you they always get me with the original hardwoods yes um i mean the original hardwoods are just absolutely gorgeous i've over the years fixed up some of these um resold them every time my wife is like why are we saving these hardwoods because it's so expensive and every time it's done i am like just look at them yeah they are absolutely gorgeous so this house has the original hardwood flooring throughout that i love it's From gorgeous 1940s 1764 square feet in the f house um you've got that picture bay window formal dining space um light and bright kitchen they've done the vinyl tile flooring in the kitchen which flows well with the natural hardwoods in in the other spaces stainless steel range oven tons of counter space um, fully fenced backyard mature landscaping you get that richland mature landscaping with these um, older f houses Mm -hmm. and that's coming in at 222 500 wow okay so these are the price ranges that we've been talking about today um, that we we see a lot of action on right now And our topic before the break that we were talking about was the handling of multiple offers. And we talked about, we can also talk about a little bit of the mishandling of Mm -hmm. multiple offers. And one of the strategies, a lot of times we see this in other states, even sometimes we see this here, but to give um, to give credit to it as a strategy in multiple offers, what we talked about is one of them, and I am by no means suggesting this, but one strategy in real estate in a multiple offer situation is to counter multiple offers at the same time. So you've got two offers. They're both not exactly what you want, but you say, you know what, um, because the risk of me countering one offer and making the other offer wait, that offer might go away. I'm just going to counter both offers at the same time. And the person that gets back to me first with it signed is who's going to get the property. Ooh. The problem with this strategy is that it opens the seller up for the risk of potentially selling the property to two different people at the same time. And so let me explain how that can happen. In our industry, a ratified contract happens not upon the signature of the other party, but upon delivery to the other, to the, to the seller or the seller's agent. Our contracts also specifically state out that you can use email delivery when delivered to two separate email addresses. There's what we call our authorized firm address and the broker's address. Mm -hmm. That is all you have to do to have delivery and to ratify a contract. So you send that counter offer out to two buyers the agent, the seller's agent, um, goes and takes a nap and is not monitoring his email and all of a sudden wakes up from his two hour nap and sees that both parties have emailed (laughs) back the accepted contract properly to both addresses. So now a lot of people are like, well, what happens in that situation? Is it whoever sent it first? Well, no, that's that's not the case. The contract that came back to that agent first is just as in force as the contract that came back second. What the seller and the seller's agent would have had to do in that scenario is when they received the first accepted offer, they would have had to withdraw their counter offer from the buyer prior to the buyer signing it. So they can, you can send a counter offer out to a buyer and you can say, okay, here's my counter offer. Get back to me, you know, within 24 hours or you set a deadline. Um, and then if you don't get back to me by then, then my counter offer expires. Well, you have the right within that time period to, to withdraw that, to take that back. Let's say you get a third offer that is fantastic. You can withdraw your counter offers from both parties and then work with the third. Mm-hmm. Prior to ratification and acceptance is the key scenario there. 
So then what happens is um, if you if a seller gets into that situation, now they're obligated to fulfill these terms, the same terms to two different people, which we know um, in practice is going to be impossible to do. You can't sell uh, the same house to two different people. So what's going to happen after that? A big freaking lawsuit probably is, mm -hmm. what, is what's going to happen. Um, a judge, somebody, you know, someone's going to end up suing somebody and they're going to have to figure out um, what happened in that situation. And that's a very, very dangerous spot for a seller to be in. Like I said, this is not a strategy um, that you see um, on our website as a very exciting way to do things, nor is it one we recommend. But it's worth talking about that it's out there and there are people that do it. Um, I've seen it in this marketplace. I've also seen other states that have multiple countered forms that allow you to counter multiple people at a time, which then when you receive back an offer negates the other offers. We do not have that. We do not have a Washington state realtor approved form that allows that to happen, which then leaves yourself up for, like I said, a whole host of problems, mm -hmm. opening up the can of worms, as they say, and we're going to stay out of that can. So, so yeah. but you, if you do come across that, that is is what you are looking at. The last strategy that people don't know much about and are sometimes shocked to hear that I wanted to talk about today is that um, you receive multiple offers and you, like I said before, you really like the terms of one offer. Maybe it's cash, maybe it doesn't have financing, but it's lower. You have another offer that's much higher um, if the seller wanted to, they could instruct their agent to call the other offer, tell them the price of the competing offer, and tell them that if they beat that by $2,000 and get that to you in the next hour, you'll take their offer. And people a lot of times are like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Do you, you're going to tell, you're going to tell the other, the other offer what my offer was. You can't do that. That's not the case. Once mm. that offer is submitted to the seller, that information, although industry standard and practice likes to say it's fully confidential, once you've released your offer and that price point to the other seller, there's nothing in that contract that says that seller cannot disclose that information to the other parties. Now, once again, you're going to have to talk to your agent about this because you have to determine Am I selling myself short by giving the buyer a specific price? Like if I say to that buyer, hey, the other offer's 250, if you come in anything higher than that, I'm gonna take your offer. So since the other offer's 250, you know, bring it in at 251 and we're golden, we're gonna go with you. Is that though cutting yourself short? Whereas if you did the strategy we talked about before the break and did highest and best, but not tell them, uh, is that going to cause one buyer to maybe go 5000 6000 over list price? So strategy, strategy, strategy. Every situation, every time is a little bit different. But these are some of the strategies that we're seeing put into play in the market that sellers are utilizing right now to get the best terms and the best price for their offers. Does that make it difficult for buyers? Well, that's a whole nother show. And we have, we've talked about that and there are great strategies that buyers can use to shine in these situations with your sellers. It's a balancing act. And right now in certain price points, um, we're really leaning towards what methods are the sellers using to maximize their price point. A little bit um, kind of complicated and in-depth topic today. So if you have more questions about that and want to consult on that, go to KenmoreTeam.com and shoot us a message. We'd be glad to talk you through what that looks like. Also, if you're a buyer out there that has ran into that a number of times and has not got the property and you want some strategies on how to deal with making your offer stand out in multiple offer situation, I've got a great team of buyer specialist that is working on this extensively right now. KenmoreTeam.com, shoot us a message. Until then, we will be right back. Next week, right here on News Talk 870.